Hey, everybody there. Welcome to class, right? Yeah, that was a shocker this morning, wasn't it? In back end. Well, John, that was very delightful. Thank you for sharing. Uh, John touched on all the right things, so I think we're done. Uh, <laughs> on a good day. You know, he really nailed it. The, the opportunity to do a fire philanthropy, uh, to teach philanthropy and engage folks in giving back generationally is exactly what we're here for. And uh, I, this Christine, I don't know if you did this or who did this on the title, Getting to the Heart of Nonprofit through a Community Foundation, but John really helped string those together. And uh, Remember the Titans is definitely one of my faves, and uh, I met with the principal of that school not too long ago and, uh, during that time, and that was a phenomenal, and uh, spent a lot of time with J.D. Vance as well. I spent uh, a couple hours preparing him for a keynote for the Council on Foundations. Uh, not too long ago. So that's, those were great, great recommendations. So this is a little bit about me. Uh, he, he already said it. This is really just to reinforce any of the BS you think you hear, whether or not you want to believe it or not. That's all this is for. Uh, I come from the Council on Foundations. We're based in D.C. And, uh, but I stayed in Indiana. So I uh, ran a community foundation for eight years, merged two community foundations, love it. Uh, it's part of who I am. And I couldn't leave. Uh, that and the wife said that DC is just too exhausting. And so she ultimately made that decision. But uh, what's really cool about what we do is we work with uh, the 800 community foundations that are here in the US. And then I'm also the global liaison, and I work with our international community foundation. So I find myself on calls with Brussels, Germany, UK, Australia, um, Brazil, and a couple others. And usually I'm trying to catch up with translations and time zones. So that's always an, an interesting dynamic. Uh, but delighted to be here with you today. Uh, why am I here? Right? You're all asking that great question. So first and foremost to me is I want to tell the Community Foundation story, and then I want to give you a little ammunition to challenge your Community Foundation. And I know they're probably squirming in their seats saying, that's not what we brought in here for. But I think there's a real opportunity through this type of a convening to do just that. I'm going to raise the question, is collaboration overrated? Another surprise there, I hope. And then finally, I'm going to leave you with a thought about how do we create impact and how do we build this ecosystem to support this notion of regional work. It's totally different, and it's probably why I think that collaboration might feel slightly overrated. So I can't think of any better way to start than with a little bit of an affirmation. Look, I can be a shark. Now, my whole house is great. I can do anything good. I like my school. I like anything. I like my dad. I like my cousins. I like my aunts. I like my Allisons. I like my mom. I like my sisters. I like my dad. I like my I like my hair. I like my haircuts. I like my pajamas. I like my stuff. I like my rooms. I like my home. My whole house is great. I can do anything good. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can do anything good. Better than anyone. Better than anyone. That's a good way to start the day. That looks slightly like my house looks on a daily basis. Couldn't imagine what it was like with 10. My father came from a household of 13, mostly sisters. So he doesn't talk about it very much. Uh, I think that's a great way to start. If we can start looking at ourselves in the mirror each day, we'd probably be okay. So let me tell you a little bit about the Community Foundation story. And first things first, we got to talk about philanthropy in this country. So my question is, how much was gifted in the U.S.? Price is right around here. Gold star is given for everyone. How much do you think was given in the U.S.? Anyone? 50 million. 50 million? Okay. Higher, lower, who wants to go next? Higher. 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 Anyone else want to throw out a number? 7 billion. 7 billion is the way back. All right. Next question. Who contributed more? Corporations, individuals, foundations, or <coughs> people do that? Look at you all. You cheat. So, first of all, seven billion, not quite enough. Three hundred and ninety billion dollars was given in the U.S. last year, and you can see the numbers right there. Seventy percent came from individuals, but then who makes up foundations? Primarily individuals, right? 
Foundations are created by individuals. Requests come from people who pass on. So in the end of the day, ask yourself, where do you tend to spend all your time trying to secure dollars? And are you in the right places? 95% is coming from individuals. So that's critical. Next thing to know is where's all that money going? So education, religion, still top choices, and then you can see some of the others. But the beauty there is it's still all across the board, right? But there's one important statistic to recognize. Only 20% of the giving is unrestricted in this country. So that means there's a lot of strings attached, right? So this is difficult work. And so that's why this impact notion and this regional approach that the Canadian Foundation is taking of inspiring people to give gifts for the future, right? For the needs that they don't know will come is so influential. Because the Canadian Foundation can grant for all these causes. And they can do unrestricted grant making, but they do need you to be part of the equation. So I want you to just get to know a little bit about community foundations, because I think they're pretty cool. I've spent a lot of time with them, so obviously I do.
So this is why community foundations and nonprofits need each other. You sort of balance each other out. Uh, number one, community uh, foundations are community anchored. And so they have a place and they have a quality of life directive that they're looking at specifically. You're very community action-based. You're very much the doers in this scenario. Uh, primarily, community foundations are working with complex gift assets, and they're working with donors. They're at that 30,000-foot elevation. So you know what? If they don't have insights from you, and they don't know how to leverage intelligence about the community that they gain from you, it's hard to work with donors to think critically about how they leave a legacy and how they leave assets. Because how many of you, just by show of hands, sit around thinking about how to give away your money? <laughs> okay, there wasn't a hand. <laughs> you all know this, I hope. The basics of philanthropy is that it's actually the love of humanity. And you know that fundraising, how many of you enjoy fundraising? So I started to enjoy fundraising when I thought about it, about teaching the joy of giving back. Teaching the joy of doing something beyond yourself. Because at the end of the day, I knew that I couldn't be the guy who reads to the children at the library and built homes for Habitat and help save lives because I can hardly handle a needle myself. You know, I, I knew that I couldn't do all that. I couldn't be in the classroom teaching. I couldn't do all those great things. And so I had to provide for my family for number one, and then number two, how could I give back to the community that helped give them to me? John's absolutely right. Try to think about your life without nonprofits touching your work along the way. We all grew up, or we all were born probably in a hospital that may or may not have been a, a nonprofit, may have been religiously ran. We went on and we went to dot daycare, child care, we went to schools, we did the little leagues, we did the Lions Club events, we did the community festivals. We are touched all the way up to school, to college, we gained from scholarships, we went to schools that are funded through philanthropy. We then probably got jobs in the communities and we helped to repay those loans and we got assistance like credits for our home mortgages when we bought a home. We keep winning from the system, right? And sometimes we don't even realize that the system is there, that the ecosystem is supporting us. It's not all privately driven. It's public and philanthropic, too. So we all create what we can't have, and that's the double-edged sword of endowments, right? You say, but there's this pot of money sitting there. Why don't we spend it, right? Well, here's why. These endowments have long-term effects that I can't even quite fathom. The notion that we could take $50,000, we could spend it really wisely today, right? We could come up with five ways to split it $10,000, or we could come up with 50 ways to split it $1,000. And then we're done. You know, and, and, and we don't have any way to replenish it unless we go back out and teach the joy of giving. But with an endowment, there's this notion of just a little bit is generated year after year. And the compounding effect is half of it you know, twice the amount is going to go out over a 25-year period. And the notion here is, is that there's some sustainability and vibrancy that you can create with a constant, steady stream of income. These are the kinds of gifts that community foundations can accept. And so if you are able to accept all these types of gifts, that's pretty impressive, but it probably doesn't leave a whole lot of time for you to do the mission work, right? Community foundations, that is their mission is to work with donors to find creative ways to use the assets that they have generated over a lifetime to give back one small piece to the community. So this is what I think is really what's at stake here. We all die. So the goal isn't to live forever. If it is, let's talk about it. I'd be interested. The goal is to create something that will. And for most, for most of us, it's the notion of we can be the greatest philanthropist no one's ever heard of. We've all heard of Gates, we've heard of Rockefellers, we've heard of Carnegie, right? We've heard of those folks, we've heard of Buffett. Those are pretty impressive and big philanthropists, you know? Uh, but each and every one of us who chooses to give back their time, talents, and treasures is a philanthropist. And I believe we can be the greatest philanthropist we've never heard of. And the Community Foundation can be the place where that is encapsulated. We're not all going to have monuments or buildings named after us. 
but we have opportunities to leave a legacy that our family, our children, our grandchildren can be proud of. I always like to ask people, what do they love about their community? What's something you all love about this community, about this place that you call home? Anyone? Diversity. Diversity? What else? The river. The river? <laughs> I like the river too. It's beautiful up here. I enjoyed my drive throughout the state. What else? What do you love? Yeah. I moved here from Central Maryland to get away from the traffic. Get away from the traffic? <laughs> I found a little bit of that on, uh, on I-80, but anyway. Yeah. What do you not love? Traffic. <laughs> what do we got to make a change on, right? And what I like to extrapolate this a little bit and say, what do you hope is still not here, or still not a challenge we're facing when my kids are growing up, and my grandkids are visiting or growing up? You were raising your hand. Small P parochialism. Say that one more time. Small P parochialism. Tell us more. Every place is very, very local is very important. So this idea of thinking regionally uh -huh. is a big jump big for a lot of people. So they wish that the yeah. localism would have less of an influence than a regional view would have. More. It is absolutely terrific to be in touch and to love your place, to love your city, to love your town, to love your community, love your neighbors. That's all critical to this. But if folks, if we're going to be strategic, which is where philanthropy comes in, Philanthropy is different than just giving away your money. You can do that pretty easily. You can just throw it in the street, and you can call that philanthropy. But I think most of us would not call that philanthropy, right? So he's absolutely right. That's what is really catalytic and big and bold about this. I think there's a real opportunity for you to think differently. And I wrote this down because I thought this was really critical, and I wanted to share this with you. I don't think that the Community Foundation is going to be successful unless you're in it with them. Transparency is going to be key. Look, yes, they make decisions and they disperse funds and they disperse grants. It's okay to tell them what you think about the process and about ways that we can improve. That kind of partnership is exactly what this is going to take. As the Community Foundation grows in its own knowledge, new funding opportunities will be uncovered. Because you know what? They're going to have had conversations with folks. And they're going to know how to connect the dots. So there's a real opportunity today to be catalytic, to think older, to think differently. Before we do that, we're going to talk about why collaboration is overrated. But I wanted to share with you a little bit about my Community Foundation. And before I do that, I wanted to share a question Christine asked me last night. She was super excited to hit me with this. She said, what if, if you could just create one fund at the Community Foundation, what would it be? And I could ask each of you, if you had $10,000 to give away, what would you do with it? And I challenge you to think about that. If you had $10,000 to give away, where would it go and why? We do have a fund. We have a fund at our community foundation. We hobbled together the funds over the years, my wife and I, and we created a fund called the Dreaming Tree. And it's all for supporting creativity, experiential learning, and music in the community to bring people together. And so we're going to advise on that fund during our lifetime. But you know what? My kiddos don't get the chance to advise. If they want to advise a fund, they're going to have to create one. But our fund will eventually move into the community fund that my family, my broader family, created, which is an unrestricted fund that can go anywhere. And I feel very good about that. And I stretched myself in, in my time to try to give 5% back to, to the community. And I'm just out of curiosity, does anyone know what the average in America is for giving? What's the percentage that they give back on, a, on an annual basis? Anybody know what the tithing was in our churches? 10%. 10%, 10% right. Anyone know what it is in the U.S.? Want to take a guess? Try to strike? Two. Come on down. Three? What else? 0. 0.5. 1.2% of Americans uh, are, is the amount that Americans give back to charity. 
Now, there's a higher percentage of 1.7% given by some Americans. Do they make more than $100,000 a year or less than $100,000 a year? That's right. You are a smart class. <laughs> All right, let's watch this video. I want to tell you a little bit about my community foundation and inspire you to keep thinking. Foundation is attempting to be this type of bold visionary. 
and it starts right here with you in the room. But it ends if you aren't with them at the table. So, a little bit of a quick historical overview. Community foundations lived a great life in the beginning of working for dead donors, which meant they didn't have anybody's opinions to take care of. They just distributed grant dollars. And then they started getting to working with living donors. We called those the baby boomers. And the baby boomers said, we trust you, but just not quite enough. So we want to have a little bit more say and control over how we're going to make a difference. And then here we are today, where community foundations are distinguishing themselves by taking on leadership by taking on a role of community convening and engaging and thinking differently. And that's where you come in. The next century, I really think the only thing I would add is that we're just going to have to keep thinking bigger. We're going to have to bring resources together at a systemic level that is bigger and bolder than just at the local level. They have the same pains as you do, as nonprofits. Typically, your board is likely going to measure how much dollars are being raised and how's the budget, things like that. Community foundations are often evaluated based on assets. And the challenge is the staff is looking at it totally on how many donors are we engaging, are we working with our nonprofit partners, are we thinking differently? And you probably deal with the same thing, you're worried about your clients and the community you serve. And then we got policymakers making decisions about rules and regulations that affect us. And it's all about money out the door and services out the door, whether it is paid for or not. So what's a measure? If you're going to evaluate your community foundation, don't do it by assets. Do it by what the reflection is of community priorities. Do they look and feel like the community that they serve? The currency of the community foundation is not financial folks. It's relationships. It's their ability to engage donors and engage founders and other opportunities to bring resources to bear on really good ideas. But that means you've got to be innovating and catalyzing those ideas. You want to challenge, are they deploying all their resources? Are they bringing their human, their physical, their social, and their reputational risk to the table to help you build community wealth? Grant making is an ingredient. It is not a solution. If you start with the money, you'll fail, period. It always sounds great, it always feels good, but it's remarkable how resilient we can be even when we're trying to create solutions without money yet at the table. And I have a thought about how money follows later. I believe it's important to seek out unconventional and find the disruptors in the room and follow their lead. Don't be afraid to disrupt the way you do things and the way you think about stuff. And in the end, this is a very cool and vicious cycle of where we can, as community foundations, inform donors when we have the knowledge and insight of nonprofits, and then we can help channel dollars back into the work that you do. Now, anyone ever think about this? Donors get involved simply because they're under the influence. How many of you have hosted a gala, a cocktail event, or something where you buy a serve a little bit of booze? Right? Yeah, donors do give very generously under influence, but they give under a broader <laughs> sense of influence, of being in, just excited by what you do. They, they, they just feel that energy, that attitude reflects leadership, is very clear in the sense of how they lead with either their checkbooks or their time or their talents. So what pulls the donor's heartstrings most is how well they know you and how well they know the work. That makes them want to give a little bit more. Here's a, here's a kicker for you. Philanthropy and the notion of giving, it's not logical, it's emotional, okay? So you can lay out the best case, the best case for support, you can identify why we need to do this, and the unfortunate reality is that people are moved by their emotions. You can give them a very logical case for giving, and it won't happen. Unless they're a billionaire and they're dealing with some tax equations and they just need to get the money out the door. If you know a lot of those people, keep them close. <laughs> How can we work together to inspire deeper engagement and giving? If you're engaging them and you're having them talk to the community foundation about legacies and about planning for the future and giving 5% because it's going to help you give more to your heirs and less to the government, those are all formidable conversation and you don't need to know any of the details, but you can trust that the community foundation is going to have your best interest in mind and that somehow they're not going to stifle off $50,000 you could use today if the donor is saying we want to talk about sustainability, viability, and how do I support this organization well after I'm gone. But 
You don't always have the time, the efficiency, the effectiveness, or the resources in human capital to actually solicit them, to steward them, and cultivate them. That's where your community foundation can come in. We know donors respond more favorably when they know the difference that's being made. I believe that nonprofits are the best at helping us share stories about the difference that gifts can make. I believe that it reinforces the commitment. And I believe that you can serve as great places for people to get to know philanthropy a little bit more personally. So think about how can you serve one of those little mini cocktail events after hours and showcase your work to donors of the Community Foundation to inspire them to want to give back and be part of the equation. Now, my favorite part, I want to talk about collaboration. How many of you really enjoy talking and hearing about collaboration? Good, answer going up. All right, that's good, that's positive. That helps a little bit. Good. But it's exhausting and it's difficult work, folks. There's no denying it. When I tried to explain to my six-year-old daughter what I was doing when I was going somewhere to talk about collective impact and collaboration, my wife always said I have a tendency to just let it go over her head. I spoke to her for 10 minutes. I thought, this time I nailed it. She gets it. She looks at it. She goes, yeah, that's easy. You just go play. <laughs> and I said, what do you need, Finley? She said, Dad, we do this all the time on the playground. One minute, I'm the queen. Next, Conrad's the king. And those are the people in the, in the ocean that are the sharks and alligators, and then the switch. And I thought, well, you know, there might actually be something to that notion. Like, if we could just play, this would be a little bit better. And if we would be cool with the notion of one day I'm the queen and the next day you're the king and all those good things, it could change the dynamics a bit about how we look at collaboration. But to answer this question, I think we have to go to the Virgin Islands, right? It's vacation time. So this is the little island down in the uh, Caribbean. It's part of the United States. It's a territory. It's an island of roughly 40,000, so not very different than uh, St. Croix is, at least, not the Virgin Islands as a whole. But St. Croix is about 40,000, not too different from a community like theirs. Well, I had the pleasure of going there back in February, I believe it was, maybe March, I can't recall now, uh, to work with them six months after two hurricanes hit their island and to talk about their nonprofit consortium and their collaboration. I know what you're thinking that when I went to St. Croix, this is what I did, this is what I enjoyed, this is what I experienced, and I was missing this in Indiana. That is all true. But a little bit of perspective. Before that, I had flown 9,000 miles for the council. I was away from home for three weeks. I visited Denver, Miami, Chicago, the same week that I went to St. Croix, and I was really missing this, and I even got a welcome home daddy because I was gone for so darn long. So the moral of the story is it was not a vacation, all right? I went to St. Croix because real work being done, despite the catastrophic storm that hit them. They were hit with two major storms back to back. And they were largely overshadowed by just a few weeks prior, where two to three hundred million dollars was raised in Houston to the flooding. And Puerto Rico is still barely raising about a hundred million, and there's far greater devastation there. The United States Virgin Islands was hit as hard as any other place. Out of the 103 residents for all the territories combined, 33,000 needed some form of assistance to try to respond to this crisis. Eight of the 13 schools on the island were condemned. The only hospital was decommissioned. They were without power for 90 days. No cell phones, no cooking, no heating, cooling, no refrigerator, nothing. Um, 90 days. Can't even flip the switch on to go to the restroom at night. They were stripped of their entire vegetation system in a matter of just two days. And they have agriculture that supports about 40 to 50 percent of the food in their school systems. So the St. Croix Community Foundation was there because the government was ill prepared to deal with this level of magnitude of storms. They opened in five days and they mobilized their nonprofit organizations who were still dealing with their own homes being collapsed, dealing with damage, and they were coming out to support the community. They were the focal point for all public and private partnerships. The nonprofit consortium incorporates 555 different representatives from across all the different sectors, and they were the first to respond. And the lessons that I have to say is that collaboration works in disaster, 
because no one can move forward until the work is done. You can't even get out of your driveway until a team comes together to start chopping up the trees to make way and to fill the potholes so that vehicles can actually move supplies throughout the island. But that doesn't work in everyday life, right? You're not hit with two Category 5 hurricanes in one week, right? So that's where this is difficult. But without this notion of work done in advance, such as what you're doing here today, you won't be able to respond when a real crisis hits. And folks, John outlined that there are real crises already existing in our community. They may not be to the level of two hurricanes, but they're crisis, right? And so we do need to mobilize. And I've always enjoyed this uh, quote that I just read again the other day. I always have to break the news to people that this ain't heaven. This is earth. And she's talking about the inevitable and inescapable rough times that life can bring us. And so that leads me to believe that we need each other. And the only way we're going to be successful in collaboration is we have to think first about abandoning our own self-interest. When you come to the table, you're not wearing the hat you normally wear on a day-to-day -day basis. You have to adopt a new agenda, which folks need. You've got to know what the agenda is. You've got to really hone in why are we coming together? What difference are we trying to make by working together? You've got to have authority in the room, and you've got to be accountable to what you're doing. You separate the two, you won't succeed. You need to be very clear about defining the roles, the responsibilities, and what are the expectations, by when, by whom. You know, if I knew that I needed to be here on June 6th, and I decided I was going to walk, I probably should have some expectations of, you know, when do I need to leave compared to when I jump in the car and when I fly in a plane. I think you plan, you plan, you execute, and you implement. And here's why. There are so much fun that can be done if you just take the time to step back and say, we're in it together, because the alternative is, is we're just going to keep the status quo. Things are going to keep working the way they worked. And if we agree that that's not acceptable, we need to make the change. The challenge here is that there are a lot of community priorities in this country and around the world. And the US, for the first time, signed on to the notion that we have developmental issues just like third world countries. We acknowledge the truth that we have poverty in this country, that we have people that are hungry, that we don't have health care that is accessible to all, and so on and so forth. So we're not alone, and we need to be doing this work. And if we don't act, it just leads to more failure of the system, right? Failure does not mean you reinvent. It simply means you adjust and you keep going. You don't have to stop what you're doing. You just relearn. You retool and you recatalyze the efforts. And if you're making headway, I'm confident that resources will be drawn to you. People like things that work. They like things that are popular. And they like to see results. So these are real opportunities for you to catalyze opportunities and for the Community Foundation to be able to be harnessing that energy and creating funds that are not only going to create support in a private way, but in the future. So increasing your impact. I want to swing through these real quick. Is your community thriving or barely surviving? And the question is, are we going to invest in the future or are we just going to manage its decline? And that is why you're here today, to think a little differently, to think more boldly. The second thing that we have to acknowledge in this country is that many people are discouraged about America, according to James Fellow of the Atlantic. But the closer they are to the action at home, the better they like what they see. So who gets them into the action? You do. By using them as volunteers, by using them as donors, by engaging them as board members and committee members and everything in between, you help them be inspired and inspiration leads to wanting to do more and to giving back. I want to leave you with one more video because I like these little interactive videos and this is class so we need to keep it entertaining, right? There once was a library, a beautiful, busy, award-winning library. Unfortunately, times were hard. The city of Troy, Michigan no longer had enough money for its library, so it scheduled a vote asking the townspeople to approve a small tax increase. This angered an anti-tax group known as the Tea Party. 
Well organized and well funded, they started posting vote no signs, mailing flyers, and making noise. They dominated the conversation, changing the topic from library, books, and reading to taxes, taxes, taxes. With no money and an election less than a month away, the library needed help. They needed something attention-getting, audacious, maybe even vile. So we decided to form a group of our own and started planting signs around town that said, vote to close the library August 2nd, book burning party August 5th. The idea of book burning is bad enough, but gleefully making it a party, well, that angered people enough to send them to our Facebook page. You people are sick. This is disgusting. Reject the wackos. Vote yes. But we didn't stop there. We created videos. Imagine this times 200,000. How cool is that? Posted on Twitter. The Troy Library might be short on money, but it has books to burn. Created items for sale. A book bag. How ironic. We placed newspaper ads, created check-ins, posted flyers, and lined up entertainment. You guys are booking a band? People became enraged. Why would you burn books, idiots? This is horrible. Cheap imbeciles. What the f*** is this world coming we to? We should burn your signs instead. Complete and total this idiots. Is really Shut this page down. Pathetic. Jerks. They posted their own links, shared with friends, debated the merits of libraries and the audacity of burning books. The conversation spread from Facebook to city council meetings, from newspapers to TV. It grew from local to national, even international news. Once it reached a fevered pitch, we revealed the true intent of our campaign. A vote against the library is like a vote to burn books. And people started posting, tweeting, and reporting all over again. In the end, we had changed the conversation completely, from taxes, 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 to library, library, library. And on August 2nd, the yes voters, voters who don't normally turn out to vote, turned out at levels 342% greater than projected. And the library won by a landslide. The town's library, its beautiful, award-winning library, had been saved. Not every story at the library has a happy ending. Fortunately, this one did. It's okay to be unconventional. It's okay to be disruptive. And it's okay to have a little bit of a quirky idea. That's all part of the rules that are going to help you get to achieving higher impact. To think differently. To be bolder. To ask new questions and not be afraid. The thing that you've got to remember going into this is, this is competitive work. You all are striving for very limited and scarce resources to do the good works that you do. So I think you need all the help you can get to inspire philanthropy, to teaching it, and educating it, and bringing people to the table. But this competitive work is all about doing good. People depend on you to have a greater impact. People you know, and people that likely know you, right? So this is competitive and important work that has to be done well. It's OK to be ambitious. Inaction is failure. We talked about that. Set to achieve more than you can accomplish alone, folks, so that you don't have to go alone, so that you must go with others. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go further, bring others with you, right? Embrace philanthropy for what it is. We don't talk enough about the love that is within philanthropy. But there's a lot of love going around this room for the work that you do and, and the opportunities you create for the community. And we have to acknowledge that we do it because we love this place. And we want others to love it too. Except we all have a shared stewardship of this community and its destiny. Where this community ends up, whether it thrives or you manage to climb, is about your shared ownership and stewardship of it. Be gritty, experiment, and embrace the quirky. Prioritize relationships, have fun, play, as my child would say, and build that shared sense of ownership for your community. Bring other people into the fold to let them know that they don't just live and work and play here, but they have an opportunity to get more. What you give is what you get. And so I really want to stress that. And I just want to leave you with this slide and this cute little guy. 
and the words of Dr. Seuss, because I think that's ultimately what you do. You care a lot. And if we do anything this morning, I think it's to take a moment to celebrate you. I celebrate the work that you do, and I hope you'll celebrate one another's work, and I hope you'll embrace it today and really take it to the next level. And think openly and honestly about how we can do things a little differently and together so that we can care for one another because we're all in this together. So with that, I want to thank you so much for letting me be with you. I really enjoyed my time in uh, upstate uh, Pennsylvania. Is that what we call it? I don't know. <laughs> it took me many months to get greater Susquehanna caress. Uh, my first lesson on Susquehanna was a little rough, but we've uh, mastered that word, and I'm just delighted to be here, and I wish you super great success for today and all that you do, and thank you.